Hello and welcome to another edition of Frightfully Forgotten Horror Movies and today we're gonna do a double feature! The Stepfather series, so one in two in one review. And fuck the third one. Yeah. <laughs> But before we get started, what are we drinking? We're drinking O'Grady's Four Leaf Clover Stout. From the Clover <laughs> Patch. <laughs> the Stepfather was directed by Joseph Rubin, and he did uh, Dreamscape and also The Good Son. It stars Terry O'Quinn. And well, a lot of people know him from the TV show Lost as yeah. John Locke, but he's also in another great, great, great Canadian horror flick, which we've covered a long time ago. Yeah, called Pin. <laughs> Jill Sholin's in this. She was in Wes Craven's Chiller. <laughs> Which they always see on VHS at these yeah. flea markets, this <laughs> shitty version. It's got like no <laughs> tape in it. We just pass it up. Yeah. <laughs> she was in the 89 version of Phantom of the Opera with Robert England. She was also in the horror movie Popcorn and When a Stranger Calls Back. Stepfather starts off, this man, right? You don't quite know who he is at first. This man taking... A, a disguise off in the mirrors in the in the bathroom putting on something else something different and while he's doing that he's whistling a tune called camp down races which is a thread through both movies yeah. which is neat din, 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 do -da, do -da. <laughs> he walks downstairs whistling this tune and it pans through the living room of this house and it's turned completely upside down, and the family's been completely slaughtered. So he then takes the ferry, and he throws his uh, suitcase into the water, and it sinks. He leaves his old life behind, and he goes to assume a new life. And he gets involved with another woman in another city, and she has a daughter. He tries to assume the role of the dad and he tries to take her under his wing a backyard barbecue and everything and he puts on like this the big speech and well, I never really knew family life until I met this one and yeah. all, all that cheesy shit but the daughter starts to suspect things because every time he gets upset he goes into that basement and there's this one scene where the daughter's down there for something and he doesn't know she's down there and then he goes downstairs to flip out, to like, to <laughs> just cut loose. Totally loses his <laughs> shit. <laughs> ah, yeah. ah. He's all smashing his workshop all up. <laughs> and she sees him do that, and he sees her looking at him. And then he just calms right down, and kind of the jig is up at that yeah. point. So Stephanie, the daughter, is really rebelling at school because she just doesn't like her home life. She doesn't like the fact that this new man is in the scene, and her yeah. mother's already remarried so quickly after her father died. She's getting into fights at school, and she gets expelled. She's got to see a psychiatrist about all this stuff, and she's explaining all this to the psychiatrist, and he's like, well... Maybe I should speak to the stepfather. He calls and he won't speak to him. Tell him I'm not here. Yeah, yeah. He's on his workshop yeah. again. <laughs> in the meantime, the brother of the wife who was killed before in the old family is still seeking out the murderer. He's out to get the son of a bitch. And he's actually getting close. And his stepdaughter is suspicious of him. So something's going to come to a boil here. <laughs> yeah. That takes us to Stepfather 2. And Stepfather 2 is directed by Jeff Burr, who directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Mm -hmm. He directed Pumpkinhead 2 <laughs> and Puppet Masters 4 and 5. So he's like the king of the sequels. Yeah, those are all pretty good. Yeah. Terry O'Quinn is in this again. And again, he was in Pin. That doesn't change. <laughs> Meg Foster's in this. And uh, we're not going to mention anything else except best of the best two. <laughs> Mwah. You got some snapping them kicks, boy. <laughs> she was in They Live, of course. 
And she's very notable because of her crazy piercing blue eyes. Yeah, beautiful eyes. Jonathan Brandis is in this, and he is in It, of course, and we had done a bit of a retrospective on It. You can click the link above. The original It, none of that remake bullshit. No, we also shit on that, too. If you want to watch that one, click the link above on that. And he's in Sidekicks. One of the best martial arts movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline Williams is in this, and she's Stretch in uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and she's also in Leprechaun 3. I wish I was a man so I could just screw myself to the floor. <laughs> what a fantastic line. And then she dies by her lips and ass blowing up. <laughs> yeah. Without wrecking how Stepfather 1 ends, Stepfather 2 takes place shortly after, and the Stepfather's in an insane asylum, being interviewed by like the new psychiatrist in town here, and they kind of start chumming it up. Mm -hmm. And he's got that sick diorama thing all made up. <laughs> yeah, he's building this, like, this diorama to like show how he feels to the psychiatrist. And destroys it during one session and he's like, oh, no, no, wait, because uh, I'm trying to rebuild. Yeah. <laughs> rebuild what's broken to the psychiatrist. <laughs> yes, yes. Takes his psychiatrist into his confidence, let his guard down and then kills him with this like, <laughs> he's got like a model of himself with this retractable like blade and fucking sticks it in the back of his head. It's all intricate. Yeah. <laughs> Assumes a new identity. He looks in the obituaries for like a deceased name and takes it. Got like the VHS tapes with the virtual dating or whatnot. Yeah, and yeah. like going through all the people. All these crazy <laughs> stupid women and everything. They're all smoking, dude. <laughs> and then he goes and he leases a house from this new development and he starts to hit it up with the realtor right. who is recently divorced yeah. with a young boy. <laughs> like perfect for him because he wants the perfect family. So he starts to befriend the, the mother and the boy, he kind of actually takes to him this time, yeah. right? He kind of does all the right things. He pulls all the right moves. He builds that stupid fucking ramp for his <laughs> skateboarding. If he hit it, he'd die. <laughs> That's all shoddy work. Yeah. He becomes like the the neighborhood psychiatrist for all the women. Oh, only the women. Yeah, which is, <laughs> come on, buddy. So he's getting pretty close to the family. The only fucking problem is that the old husband or the old dad wants back into their life. So he tells the mother that he wants to have a chat with the dad, right? So he can kind of smooth things over a little bit. Try and get the dad back into their lives. Bullshit. <laughs> So the dad comes over and he's all smoking and he gets all pissed off and drops the smoke on him. Puts out the cigarette. He all mashes it into his carpet. The stepfather, he's like, well, maybe we went about this all wrong. He's like, uh, maybe we should back up a little bit. And he takes his bottle. He's like, I didn't mean to crack open this bottle. He just smashes it over his head. <laughs> Stabs him in the throat with the remainder of the bottle. As he's lying on the carpet, he gets a call and he answers, it's the mother. How's things going over there? Well, we're just wrapping things up here. <laughs> <laughs> One of the women starts to suspect that he's not who he says that he is, right? And she starts tampering with his mail. Cause she's the mail person. He, yeah. She gets a bit of evidence on him that he's claiming to be this person that's in this picture, in this photo. <laughs> And she confronts him about it. People can change, you know? It's like, this much? <laughs> it's like a photo from his high school basketball <laughs> team and they're all black guys. It's like an all black team. <laughs> How are you going to explain that one? Well, he can't. He doesn't. <laughs> Blackmails him with this photo and with the info that she has on him and says, well, if you don't come clean about who you really are, I'm gonna tell everyone with this evidence. 
And that's where we're gonna end that. So if you wanna see what happens in Stepfather 2, keep watching. So I hope we did a good job of <laughs> summarizing two movies without yeah. giving away the ending of either. Stepfather 1 and 2 are really fun, neat kind of double feature because they do flow together really well. Mm -hmm. Like you can watch them back to back. They're seamless. Yeah, yeah. But they do kind of need each other, right? Yeah. Like when you watch the first one, you kind of think like, uh, something's a little missing or the pacing's a little off or it needs more of certain things. And then you get all of that in the second one, In the one, second right? one, right? It's interesting. They're really good companions to each other, which is why we're doing this as like a joint review. The first thing we have to mention about these movies is Terry O'Quinn. The guy just <laughs> is like a master at playing this character. Yeah, he's a perfect one-man show. Oh man, like he's so good at playing like so nice and perfect yeah. and the perfect father and all the stuff but he's really a fucking maniac yeah and he can take it from zero to ten in no yeah. time at all which is great yeah so he's great at playing both those you know the yeah. proper man and then flipping out in the in the workshop you know like <laughs> yeah. he's right on the edge yeah. like constantly yeah. and you can you get that sense that he can do anything. And he really right. does make these movies. Like, these movies would be nothing without Terry O'Quinn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's fantastic. And he was actually scared of being typecast. And the rest of the supporting characters, right, for both of these movies. So in the first movie, the movie itself and the characters sort of mirror each other, right? So they're a lot more realistic and sensible. They're yeah. down to earth. And in the second movie, it plays out a little more comical and a little more bashfully, a little more elevated. A, a, little, a little more campy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Stephanie in the first movie, being, you know, the stepfather's daughter, is more relatable, more mm -hmm. down to earth, and I think actually a better actor and all this kind of stuff. And you kind of, it's, it, that's more fleshed out. And in the second movie, Jonathan Brandis, still a good actor, it's a bit more cheesy. Mm -hmm. Whistling together in the fucking <laughs> kitchen and everything. Then like making that sandwich. Yeah, like, this is a two-man operation yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just all a bit more cheesy. The characters actually reflect movies. So the characters in the first one, more realistic, more relatable. Second movie, more kind of like silly, fun, and fun, can, yeah, campy. And, and campy, right? And that goes with the atmosphere too, like the way the movie shot and, and filmed, like in the first movie, it feels realistic. It's This is a real neighborhood, this really exists, you know? You get that feeling like you're there yeah. in the neighborhood. Second one is more atmospheric and you can tell it's, it's lit a certain way to make you feel a certain way, right? Right, right. I think it's also a little surrealistic. Yeah, it's very, of, it's too, much right? more surrealistic in the second one. The, the atmosphere in both movies reflect its intent. You know, mm. the first movie is more serious, second one a little more campy, and you get that. Yeah. With the way it's shot. There's a lot of symbolism in both these movies. Like a lot of symbolism, like the use of mirrors and stuff, because he's a always looking at himself in the mirror when he's changing his sick disguise. Kind of like when he kept getting kicked out of the bar and then he kept putting these sick disguises on trying to get in again. I thought they would work. I'll have a dirty monkey, please. I must be daydream believing. Get your ass in the next train to Clarksville and get the fuck out of here. What the hell is this? King George and his Technicolor dream code? May I have a king's best bitter, please? I thought I told you to get the hell out of here. What the fuck is this, Halloween? You can't wear that shit in here. Give me a boiler maker, bitch. Take your burnt ass and take it back to the fucking boiler room. They use the mirrors quite a bit. In the first one, he's always looking in the mirror. Then at the end, he jumps through the mirror, like he's breaking through that yeah, yeah. that disguise. He's, he's now his real self. In the second one, in that great shot where he's in the motel and he's looking in the mirror, and the way it's shot where there's like different reflections of him across the walls, like all of his selves yeah. 
you know, which is interesting. I love that. Sick bird house that he, because oh, he yeah. wants the perfect house. He's always trying to make the perfect house. The bird house he's making in the first one. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, they chop it down. Like, no, it's not a perfect house. And in the second one, he's making that house again, that diorama yep. house. He's always trying to make the perfect house. Yeah, because he keeps repeating himself. The definition of insanity. Exactly. Right? Repeating yep. the same thing, trying yep. to get a different result. In both movies, he has the perfect situation, putting himself into the perfect family. It's him who's not perfect, his, his right? His own psychosis is what fucks it up. Yeah, he yeah. fucks up his own situation, which just so happens to be perfect. Yeah. Which is exactly what he's looking for. <laughs> There's great showdowns in both these movies. In the first movie, like, you get a real good build-up. They fight throughout the whole house. Yeah. From, like, into the attic and everything, and, like, they tear apart the whole house. And in the second one, it takes place in the actual... Like where the wedding is, mm -hmm. like in the wedding hall, and they destroy the whole like reception area. The cake <laughs> yeah. and everything, like, oh, I was all up more upset about the cake yeah. than anything. <laughs> he whistles that song in the first movie, mm -hmm. and it doesn't amount to anything. But in the second movie, it's his downfall, yeah. whistling that song, because it gets him caught. And I love that, like, they take a little simple thing from the first one that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it's like they had the second yeah. one in mind already. And they weave it into the second one, and it the whole movie, it, like, teeters on that. Yeah, that, yeah. That's the crux. That's his downfall. Another neat thing about this sequel is that it's kind of just as much a prequel in a way, because mm -hmm. it does take place after the first movie, and it continues that story, but... In the first movie, you don't see how he actually weaves his way into these families. And you see that in the second movie. Yeah. So yeah, it takes place after the first, but you see what he does to get into the situation that he needs to be in. Don't get a backstory on him. You don't know who he really is inside I or love that. outside. Yeah. You know nothing about him! Because he's done this so many <laughs> times. He's so removed from his real self, you'll never know. No, and then the cops, like, they make a point in saying, it's like, it's all dead ends. We don't know who this guy is. Because he's been doing this for so long, and... You can't backtrack it. I enough, yeah, 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 to find out who he really was. That is what makes that character. Yeah. Like, a lot of times, backstories are what make the character. In this is what he does moving forward. It's like the lack, of, the lack of the backstory yeah. who makes the character in this, which is a very interesting he, thing. Yeah. The stepfather is a great character. He's a great horror slasher, I think. Mm -hmm. Even though he's not really a slasher so much, he's just a good horror character. Well, this has happened in real life. People have infiltrated families pretending to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's happened probably millions of times. <laughs> yeah. So the Stepfather series 1 and 2 work perfectly hand in hand. You know, the first one is a bit more serious. Mm -hmm. It's more of a suspense thriller. And the second one's more of like a... Comedic horror, I would Comedic say. horror, like 80s style <laughs> kind of slasher in a way. Yeah. And yeah. it's neat because they kind of tell the same story, but in a different way. They both expand on the character and like the, the, the situations he gets into without expanding on his fucking backstory, on which him. is so interesting. Yeah. yeah, if you're looking for a good double feature, you know, this is yeah. a really good double feature sequels that you can watch back to back in one night. And the two need each other, really. You can't watch the one without the other, I think. Right. Because like when I watched the first one, and yeah, it's like, it has its pacing issues. And I think it could have did with one more kill, really, to help with the pacing, I, yeah. I thought. And then the second one comes along and it redeems all of that. And it's like, yeah. oh yeah, you just, it fills the gaps and it's like, it leaves you with a far better sense of these movies. And it's like, yeah, you just redeemed yourself. I love both of these movies. So you kind of need to watch them both together to get the whole scope. Yeah. And they would actually, like, if you were to, like, take all the fluff out of both movies, 
condense him into one. Condense him into one. It would be just a perfect fucking slasher thriller. Mm -hmm. Might be a little fan edit that maybe I do one day. That would be a pretty wicked fan edit, I think. Yeah. Condense this down to like a good solid hour and 45 minutes or yep. something. Hour 50. There you have it. There's our take on the Stepfather movies. And if you have any other ideas or thoughts on these movies, let us know in the comments. And until next time, keep drinking. Thank you.